Former MLB player and World Series champion Ryan LaVarnway was called up and sent down from the majors 26 times. And now he uses those lessons as a keynote speaker and a leadership coach. But he speaks about what he learned through those experiences and much more on this episode of Iggy Sports Talk. Welcome back into Iggy Sports Talk. I'm your host, Jake Nizuski, or Iggy for short. I want to thank you so much for tuning into this episode. If this is your first time watching or listening to Iggy Sports Talk. In each and every single episode, I try to look at the deeper aspects of sports and life and focus on the mental side of the game. And I do just that in this episode with former MLB player and World Series champion Ryan LaVarnway, where, as I mentioned in the opening, he was sent down and called back up 26 different times, but he had a long 10-year career in the majors. But throughout those experiences, he learned a lot of life lessons, which he uses now today as a keynote speaker and a leadership coach. But in this episode, he not only speaks about how he uses those lessons to apply to his current life, but also shares some really cool stories from his career. And one story that actually was a huge contributor in helping the Red Sox win the 2013 World Series. But without further ado, let's get into my conversation with Ryan LaVardway. Really appreciate you coming on today, Ryan. And, you know, we, we've, we've spoken before. I had you on, you know, my Red Sox podcast in the past. I've, you know, watched you for multiple years as a big Red Sox fan. You know, people who have watched this podcast long enough know I'm a huge Boston sports fan. So it's been incredible to see, you know, what you've been able to do after your career, not only in, you know, the mental health and sports space, but, you know, now coaching a little bit, doing a little bit of uh, analyst work as well. So it's, it's been awesome to see you flourishing post-career. Thank you. Thank you. For for 15 years of my career, the scariest question I ever got asked was, well, what are you going to do after baseball? Yeah. Um, so we're in that now and I'm still figuring it out. I think as an adult, I guess it's a lifetime process of figuring out what you want to be when you grow up. Um, it felt like for, for the 15 years of my career, I didn't have to think about it because I was doing the only thing I've ever wanted to do. So uh, now we're we're on the other side. And throughout that, you know, work prior to, you know, ultimately retiring, uh, how did, you know, you land on wanting to, you know, go towards more of like the mental health aspect and, and really trying to help others in that aspect? You know, did, did it, is this something that came to you earlier on in your life? And did you figure out that passion or, you know, how did it kind of come about? Honestly, I, I, I really had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, for me, it's been a process of trying things and seeing how I like them. Uh, I, I've read exactly half of a book that I'd never finished yet. Uh, it's called uh, I Work Identity. It's called Work Identity. Um, and it really speaks to me. It was recommended to me actually by one of the guests on my podcast, who is a mental health professional. And in this book, it talks about like, if you've done something for a long time, Transition is going to take a long time. It could take up to three years to feel like you've fully transitioned uh, into a new thing. And the best way to do it in practice is to actually test things out, put the shoes on, walk a mile in those shoes. Uh, you need to see how you see yourself doing it, how you see yourself in the world's eyes doing it um, versus everybody thinks that you just sit back, you make a pros cons list, and then you know exactly what you want to do. Uh, that's great in theory, but not in practice. So for me, it's it's been uh, I had the opportunity to to do some TV and I tried it and I loved it. And if the, all the regional sports networks were still on track, I'd probably still be doing that. I had the opportunity to start my own podcast. I've really enjoyed that. I've had some opportunity to do keynote speaking, to do some leadership training, now to do some coaching. And I'm just following the opportunities until I have to make some harder choices, but right now it's, you know, every opportunity that comes up, I try to say yes, I test it out and I, I try it on for size. And throughout all those different experiences, what, what have you learned about yourself throughout those? Oh man. Um, honestly, I've, I've learned that at a certain point you will have to choose, right? Uh, I went through the major league baseball career transition program. And I think of this as like a guidance counselor for adults. They have you do an aptitude test, a skills test, a values test. And then they have someone that you've never met, read your results and tell you, you know, this is what you should, these are the three or four different fields you should explore. 
Huh. Well, I was hoping they would narrow it down. Like, basically, I was hoping they would make the choice for me. So I didn't have to think about it, right? Uh, instead, they did the opposite. They said, hey, we, we really don't see results like this very often. Uh, you could really be good at anything you choose to do. You're like a modern day Renaissance man or some BS. Like the hardest thing for you is going to be finding meaning and feeling uh, fulfilled. And I was like, well, that's why I'm here. Tell me, tell me what to do. Um, and so as I, as I pursue these different things, right, TV, uh, podcasting, speaking, leadership coaching, co uh, on-field coaching, at a certain point, you do have to choose. You, you, you can do anything you want as long as you do one thing. Right. I've been recruited to do mortgage sales, to do insurance sales, to do financial managing, uh, financial advising. But if you want to get really good at any of those things, you have to give yourself to it. And that's that's why as athletes, we're so good at what we do is because we give all of ourselves to it. I gave all of myself to baseball for 15 years as an amateur and then another 15 years as a pro. So 30 years, I gave all of myself to this one thing. You think about it. If you were going to buy a mortgage or you're going to buy insurance or you're going to invest with someone as a financial advisor, you want someone that has given all of themselves to that career. Right. You don't want, you know, a theoretical Ryan who has one foot in mortgage and one foot in financial managing and one foot in coaching and one foot in TV. Right. So yeah. at, a, at a certain point, you do if you want to be great at anything, you got to give yourself to it. So. That was a long way of saying, uh, you asked, what have I learned? Um, I've learned that uh, I think it, it come, a choice comes to something and then you give yourself to it. And that is where meaning will come from, not the other way around. Yeah, and I bet throughout all these different experiences, you've kind of like brought yourself back to like step one, you know, and, you know, even, you know, tying it back to, you know, your playing career of, you know, there's baby steps with this. There's, you know, getting comfortable with it. And also there's the anxiety that comes with it of, am I even like good at this? You know, and, and you know, some, a little bit of imposter syndrome, but I mean, all of those lessons that you took from your career and just obviously life, you know, I, I bet it must be cool to see them, you know, now applying it to now what you do. Uh, and, you know, something that, you know, when, when, you know, preparing for this and, you know, looking throughout your journey, I really connected with, uh, your experience in high school as, as somebody who, you know, was five, four, uh, was told, you know, not good enough, you know, at that age, you know, I didn't make my middle school teams two years in a row. Cause I was too small. Uh, and, you know, I'm curious from, you know, that experience of, of being told not good enough. And then, you know, your senior year saying your coach saying, you know, why not, you know, how does that help you now in your own life, you know, being able to, you know, have that motivation to continue to keep going. Yeah, I, you think you nailed it on the head there, Iggy. It's for me, it, and, and I even bring it back to my professional career also, right? I got called up to the major leagues to accomplish my dream 26 times, which means I was sent down, traded, or outright released 26 times. Like, I, I am always under the mentality that I've worked my way up from the minor leagues before. I'm willing to work my way up from the minor leagues again in any industry. So I'm willing to do the work. I'm willing to be the hardest worker in the room, the most committed. Once I give myself to something, uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not too too good or too big to do the grunt work or to start from the bottom all over again. And you know, through those times, you know, when there's those 26 different you know times where you're either released, sent down, and you know those eight different teams that you played for, how did you sort of like speak to yourself to keep that motivation going and into sort of uh, continue to keep on moving forward and not get deterred sort of on the overall vision. Yeah. So for me, uh, it's certainly something that you need to learn for yourself. And the first few times I was sent down, it was probably harder on me than, than the last 10, 15 times. Cause you learn how to deal with it. But what I learned eventually was uh, get to neutral when times are bad don't dip into the negatives. And this is this is something that uh, Trevor Moad talks about in his books. You know, Russell Wilson is big into this mindset of when times are tough, go to the facts. So for me, it was, okay, was this because of poor play? Was this because someone that is on a contract is healthy? Is this because there's no opportunity? Uh, or is this something that, that I can take ownership of? Uh, you know, is it the business of baseball or or is baseball telling, trying to tell me something? 
get to the facts, try to keep your emotions out of it. And then from there, I, I, what I would try to do is take ownership, take ownership of what can I do to improve? What can I do to take a, a next step forward? Uh, because if you can take your ownership of your failures and take ownership in the tough situations, then you'll feel like you have the opportunity to then take ownership of the next success as well. Yeah, because I feel like, you know, that that rejection, I guess, aspect or the, or the feeling of that, you know, that can be looked at, obviously, with, you know, any career, you know, and I, I bet there was that feeling in your mind of, you know, why is this happening to me? But then also the feeling of nobody's going to dictate my journey, but me. Yeah, I mean, at a certain point, you have, you have to recognize, like, this is how the world sees me. I am, uh, you know, a major league third catcher, an insurance policy uh, that when I'm needed, I'm I'm needed. And, and that's a great role to play if you own it, right? If you feel sorry for yourself, oh, I'd rather be a one or two, you're going to make yourself miserable. But you get to the facts, right? Like, how can I, how can I take ownership of this? How can I make the best of this situation? And the only thing that's going to change it is good play. Ultimately, you don't like it, play better in everything, in whatever you're doing. I believe in meritocracy, right? If you're good enough, they'll find you. If you're good enough, you'll get to where you want to be. If you're good enough, your dreams will come true. Yeah, I, I think that's the best way to look at it as well as, you know, continuing to, you know, have that perspective, like you mentioned of like, what can I be grateful for, you know, and, and what what do I currently have? And, uh, you know, I, I heard a story on, on another podcast that you did, you speaking about, you know, one of the worst days of your career, kind of, you know, getting getting released uh, as a triple A player. And, you know, your your tires also, uh, you know, were blown out, you, you didn't have anywhere to go. And then sort of like the next day was one of the best days of your career. Can you kind of tell that story a little bit? Yeah, so June, I believe it was, 2019, I'm playing in AAA for the Yankees. I'm coming off of an oblique injury. I had let myself get a little chubby that year. I'm not feeling great about myself. Uh, I was playing very poorly, and I got released from AAA, and I deserved it, right? I, I didn't deserve to be on that team anymore. Uh, and as, as I pack up my locker, I go out to my car. My, my tire's flat, so I, I'm stuck in the parking lot waiting for AAA to come. And before my tire even gets fixed, my agent calls. And, and the first conversation we have is like, I'm like, did you ask for this? Like, is there a better opportunity somewhere? And his answer was, I, I didn't know this was coming. It's the middle of the season. Everybody has their catchers already. I'm going to do what I can do, but I don't know what I can do. So I was hopeless. I thought that might be the last day of my professional career. You never know. And then he calls me back an hour later. And I guess somebody on the Yankees team, big league team, got hurt. So the Yankees wanted me back. And he had talked to the Pirates, who I had played for the year before, and they were like, don't sign anywhere until our night game is over. We want to have the conversation. And then within an hour after that, the Cincinnati Reds called and said, we had two catchers get hurt today. We'll put them in the major leagues tomorrow. How fast can you get here? Wow. So it was like I went from, from just – hopeless and, and down and out to the, just this huge opportunity coming because I was available, right? Not because of good play. I didn't earn that opportunity. Uh, but now my, my goal and my vision was how do I take advantage of this opportunity in the best way, even if I didn't necessarily deserve it. So we packed our apartment. We tried to break our lease. My wife drove eight hours to Cincinnati. I got on a flight at four in the morning. I had to get a physical. I had to get a new uniform, move into a locker, uh, sign my contract, all the, the things behind the scenes to then go out on the field. And I, I happen to have the best game of my life. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that that's incredible. And, you know, I, I think it, you know, it can tie back to life too, of, of just like, you know, something happens and it it's not so much of like, you know, how you react or, you know, the circumstances that are happening to you, but you don't know how that could ultimately be an opportunity uh, to, you know, help your career or, you know, a, a moment like you even mentioned where, you know, you didn't expect or you were hopeless at that moment. And then, you know, snap of a finger, there's three different incredible opportunities that, you know, you, you could be able to fill in. Yeah. When I'm doing my leadership coaching, um, one of the things we teach is try to reframe every situation so that it can serve you. 75% of job success is determined by a person's level of optimism and their ability to see challenges as opportunities instead of stress. So anytime you can reframe something, 
so that it can serve you in moving forward and continuing to move towards your goals, you're going to be much more successful than if you let situations that arise become stressors or, or psych you out. Right. I, I completely agree with that. One thing, anytime that happens to me, you know, I try to remind myself I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. This is all happening for me. Everything happens for a reason. Just those, those three sayings sort of just relieve the anxiety for that moment. And, you know, throughout your career, you know, especially during, you know, you're, you're in world series champion during that 2013 season, you know, you brought up the word leadership, especially throughout those playoffs. Uh, was there any player that really stuck out to you that really exemplified that leadership skill that ultimately, you know, helped the Red Sox hoist up the trophy at the end of the season? Man, that, that 2013 team was a team full of leaders. And, you know, I can name a few, but there's definitely more than I could even name because I believe in the best organizations and on the best teams, everybody becomes a, a holder of the standard. Everybody embodies what we stand for and everybody leads in their own way. In that team, in particular, Johnny Gomes set the tone for every day. Mike Napoli, great leader, doing the small things, you know, running the bases hard, even though you wouldn't expect him, right? He's a he's like a, a round-bodied, barrel-chested, strong hitter, but he's one of the best base runners I've ever seen. You know, Dustin Bedroya, obviously, vocal leader, chirping, never shuts up. David Ortiz, leading by example, coming up huge when we need him. Ryan Dempster, leading with humor, keeping it light. Uh, David Ross, leading with humor vocally, uh, even though he didn't play very much. Uh, on the on the pitching staff, you had Lester going out there, leading by example, taking the ball every fifth day. John Lackey doing the same, but talking a little bit more than Lester did. Everybody on that team uh, was a leader in, in a way. I think that ultimately obviously helped the team you know, at, you you know, you could just feel the aura around that team. That, that's honestly like my favorite season as a Red Sox fan. A lot of people bring up, you know, 2018 just because they were so dominant. But I mean, the underdog mentality that team had, especially even, you know, going into the ALCS uh, after Anibal Sanchez, you know, essentially like one hit them. And then, you know, you got to go back and, you know, try and come back. And, you know, obviously Ortiz had his ultimate grand slam. But I heard you kind of speak about, you know, Ryan Dempster had had a speech uh, prior to the ALCS sort of, you know, talking about these three Fs. And it ultimately came to fruition and helped the Sox ultimately advance to the World Series. Yeah, Demp, Demp held this meeting and and he was completely naked when he when he held it. He had he had, he had on red socks up to his knees, I think and a jock strap to cover, you know, the the boys downstairs. Um, but other than that, he, he shows up and, and he told that we were going to win the World Series because of the three Fs. And, and he's going around the room, you know, like this with his three fingers. And I remember I was sitting on the leg press thinking to myself, F, fair ball, you know, first base. I couldn't think of anything in the moment. And, and then he goes, fundamentals, first F, fundamentals. We're going to do them. They're not. I'm like, oh, all right, makes, makes sense. Second half, foul tips. Salty, Rossi, you got it. LaVarnway, you got no chance, kid. And I was like, oh, boy, I got called out. All right, whatever. Third half, four run homers. And, and we all go crazy. You know, I, I ended up driving him home that day because he ended up, he was beside himself, couldn't drive, couldn't drive home. But the four run homers thing, you know, when I'm giving my keynote speeches, I bring this up because four on homers isn't what you call it, right? What do you call it? Grand slam. It's a grand slam, right? But but what he had done is he'd given us a language for success, a vision of, of success, of something that we could relate to, something that was uniquely ours. And that if we if we saw it, we would know, right? It would be a signal that his his forecast, his his vision had come true. And in that ALCS. We were down two games to one, and we were down by four runs. And David Ortiz hits a grand slam to tie it, not to go ahead, just to tie it. But in that moment, as we ran around, we weren't yelling grand slam. We're yelling four run homer at each other because the vision is coming true, right? Jack Hammer, Dempster's alter ego, he called it, right? And, and now we had this language for success, so I encourage – companies that I speak to, associations, leadership teams, if you can create a vision and create a language for success for your group that 
doesn't matter if anybody else understands it, but it means something to you. That's going to be, that's going to help lead your team to success more than anything else you do. I think, you know, like you said, it set the intention, you know, so, so you guys are already amped up and, and knew the jobs that you had to fulfill to ultimately win the game, you know, obviously it helps if you score a few runs and Ortiz definitely helped with that. But I mean, I think especially with the resiliency of that team and, you know, sort of, you know, the resiliency that you had throughout your career, something, you know, I, I read that you posted on, on LinkedIn, it was sort of mastering the controllables. And I, I think in life, just in general, there's a lot of things that aren't always in our control, you know, whether it's career wise, whether it's personally wise. And that's something that I always try to go back to is like, how can I control the controllables? And I'm, I'm curious how you try to do that in your life. Man, you have to be relentless because there's so many there's so many things you could choose to care about. Right? You know, I, I follow the Daily Stoic. It's a, a podcast and a and an Instagram handle I really enjoy. I've actually been on his podcast. He's awesome. Uh, but he posted something recently that uh, I don't even know who said it. Right? It's a great saying. He said, "Don't ever complain or explain." And and to me that means like if you're spending money, if you're spending your time and energy complaining about something that you can't control, it's wasted. If you're spending your time and energy complaining about something you can control, well, then you should just fix it. And if you're spending your time and energy explaining something that didn't go your way or a failure, you should be spending that energy fixing it for next time or improving yourself. So it's just time wasted or time better spent. Yeah, I, I think ultimately like it's, like we even talked about before, like that all happens for a reason. I I, I think especially with those, you know, controllables, like, you know, it, it, different things come up in your life, different situations get thrown at you. And, and then there's that, you know, feeling like, you know, that overwhelming and, and, you know, trying to, you know, cover all those bases and trying to control everything when, you know, you can't ultimately do that. You can only do your part in, you know, those different aspects of your life and, you know, just try to get 1% better each day and, and, you know, learn from those different situations. Exactly. And, you know, for you, like outside of, you know, what you're currently doing in your career, I, I, you know, you're big into the mental side. Um, what are you currently working on, you know, mentally or, or personally that, that you're, you're comfortable sharing with, you know, everything that's kind of going on, you know, right now, you know, in your professional life? To me, it's I'm just trying to build. Right. I'm trying to on the speaking side, on the leadership side, I'm trying to find as many people and help as many people as I can. Right. You want to make an impact in this world. And on the coaching side, to me, it's more patience right now. Uh, I'm new to the Cubs organization. I'm new to coaching in general. And I remember when I was a player, if a new guy came in and tried to make a huge change right away, I didn't trust him yet. So in with coaching with the Cubs so far, my goal has been uh, to be seen, to be present, to observe, to learn, to watch guys, get to know guys, build trust. And then as the season progresses, right, we haven't even started minor league spring training games. Those start tomorrow. I'll get to see these guys in action. I'll get to see them go to war. I'll get to be with them, near them, uh, you know, not going to battle with them, but supporting them in any way that I can. And then as the season progresses, I hope that with that relationship, with that trust, I'll be able to help guide them and to be their best. I bet as a coach now you're starting to see your your younger self a little bit in, in some of the in some of these different guys and you know you were a former top prospect. Uh, how have you tried to you know mentor some of those younger prospects or those younger players to you know pass on that knowledge that you gained throughout those experiences? Yeah, yeah. The biggest thing is that it's not about me anymore. It's about them, right? So if I share an experience uh, for their benefit, I will. But I don't sit around and tell stories about the glory days. I don't say like, oh, this is how I used to do it, right? Yeah. It's, you know, it, uh, what struggles are you feeling? Uh, how are you feeling about it? And then if if it makes sense, if it will benefit them, then I can share, well, oh, this is what I tried to do. But only if it benefits if it benefits them. And I'm, I'm trying to keep in perspective every day that I'm here for them now. Like I had my time. I had my career. I have so much to be proud of. And now now it's time to give back to the next generation of players. Yeah, that completely makes sense. I, I think that's the best way to go about it. And even like the patience aspect that you mentioned too. And I bet, you know, that 
can tie itself into, you know, as your you know, daughter continues to grow up, you know, all those different skills, you're already working on them as well. But you know, just last thing for, you know, throughout your career, especially, you know, during some of those tougher times, what was some of the best advice that you received that, you know, you think about to this day? Man, best advice. It's always been uh, when a coach believed in me. It's always been when they saw potential or they saw perspective that I wasn't seeing yet. Now, one story we haven't told yet on this pod today is uh, when I was in college, I wanted to win all American. I'm sorry. I wanted to win all Ivy league. That was my goal was to win all Ivy league. And it was my hitting coach in college. that actually suggested you should go bigger. You should go for all American. And if he hadn't raised the bar for me, I don't think I am where I am here right now because he just made my world bigger. He made my expectations for myself higher. And, and, you know, your stomach kind of drops with the weight of that responsibility, but I ended up living up to it. And the very next year, I was the first All-American in over 25 years at Yale. I, I won the national batting title. And if I, I think if I didn't have that bigger goal, I never would have got there. I had coaches along the way to do the same thing. Like, hey, you know, you won player of the year last year. You should do it again. Or it doesn't matter what you did last year. It's what you do now keep it in perspective, keep the, the, the big picture vision in the forefront so that you, you embody the type of person, the type of player that lives up to that. And for me, that was always what it, what it was about. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I think that's so important for anybody, just not discounting your full potential and, and, you know, also, you know, not always staying where you're comfortable, you know what I mean? Getting a little bit outside of your comfort zone and striving for, you know, bigger things than maybe you could have imagined. But, you know, I think that's amazing insight, Ryan. And, you know, I've, I've really appreciated your time throughout today, you know, sharing some of your experiences throughout your you know, now professional career, you know, outside of baseball, but also during your baseball career. And, you know, you brought up your podcast, but for anybody, that you know not only wants to support your your podcast but currently what you're doing as well post baseball career how can they do that amazing uh my podcast is called finding the way with ryan labarnway uh my kids book came out in august i'm very proud of it it's been getting a lot of great feedback it's called baseball and belonging you can find that on amazon and if you want to check out anything else i'm up to my instagram is at our labarnway uh linkedin i'm easy to find and my website is just ryan Awesome, man. Thanks so much for coming. I hope that you did enjoy my conversation with Ryan and you were able to take some very valuable lessons from his experiences and you're able to use those in your own life because truly, why not you? Why can't you go out and live your dreams? I, I, I feel like everybody has this fear in their mind or makes up these scenarios or uses comparisons or you know, one situation knocks them down and they don't really react in a way to where it could pick them back up, kind of like we saw Ryan do in some of the different stories that he explained where he got knocked down and he looked at it as an opportunity to really bounce back up. And I feel like in each and every single episode, there's so many different lessons that we can learn through other people's experiences. And that's why I love conversations like the one that I just had with Ryan. But if you want to hear more episodes just like this, Make sure to subscribe to Iggy's Sports Talk over on YouTube or whatever audio platform that you listen to so you get updated when new episodes come out. But you can also check out episodes that are already out with former and current MLB, NFL, and NBA players and many other people who have great experiences that you're able to learn from to apply to your own life to help you ultimately live this life to the fullest and be able to take things and get 1% better each and every single day. That's honestly my goal with each episode that I put out on this podcast. But but I really appreciate you tuning in, and I want to thank you guys so much for all the support. It truly does mean the absolute world to me. But I hope that you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you and talk to you next time. Peace.